because when I went down there, the principal was standing there and one of the counselors was standing there and they had just been talking about mass. That They had an empty box in their hands and they gave out the last of the mass that morning and they were trying to figure out what to do and when yours truly walks in and says, here's a thousand mass. And isn't that neat how the Lord works things out like that? And so we want to thank each of you for participating in that. This is the first step, we hope, uh, to begin a uh, missional pathway into the school to build relationships with the staff there, the students, the parents. That's our long-term goal there. And uh, we, what we want to do is eventually create a mission team specifically for that elementary school. So if you can do things, you think, well, I've got to do all these really big things. If you can bake like little bread uh, for like 40 people, 40 little things of bread, you can be on our mission team because it starts with just giving gifts in the name of Jesus and letting people know we care. Are you good with calligraphy? Can you write a, just a little note or a little prayer? You can be on our mission team. Can you donate like some candy to put into a bag or can you donate the bags? Or can you help us as we pass it out in person to each of the staff members? So if any of that uh, interests you, you're like, hey, I'd like to talk to you about that, pray about that, come see me, be happy to, to talk to you further about that. Uh, we do need nursery workers, workers, children's church workers. Come see us if, if you can assist with that. Uh, sermon notes uh, for uh, my sermons are online. Actually, I, I put it there before I came here because uh, I'm going to be busy later on, so I dumped it there. And there's also, Cindy, can you hold up that piece of paper there? We also have sermon notes on the uh, Welcome Center. It's that kind of bright orange, pinkish, whatever color, and you can help yourself to that. All right, let's stand and uh, look around, shake some hands, let people know how happy you are to see them on this beautiful day that God has made. Good morning, everyone. Please, please stand and worship with us. How was the roads on the way in here? Everybody have a long drive? Close drive? Mary, how are your roads from Albion? How are the roads? Yeah. It's kind of bad when the city, the city outdoes the uh, state because it Free hadn't been touched and Kinnaville was clear on many streets. Mm. How's everybody doing? Good, it's good seeing your faces. You guys please stand and worship with us.
Thank you.
last Sunday, um, in the evening sometime, Pastor Mike messaged me um, from Florida, and uh, I was jealous because he said we are in Florida. But um, so anyways, uh, he sent me this these lyrics for a song, and he said, Roy, find this song. He said, we heard this at church today. They did it, and it's absolutely beautiful. So uh, I, just got on my, I was laying down at night. I was going to go to bed, and I looked at the lyrics, and I got on YouTube and started typing in the chorus words, and find the, I found the song and sent it to him, and he said that was it. So I never thought about it anymore. I thought, I'll listen to that later. So yesterday, I get up, and I'm remembering that Pastor Mike sent me a song, so I pull this up and listen to it, and I couldn't shut it off like 10 times. We'd already had our songs. I came in here Friday night and got songs ready for your day. So I'm messaging John yesterday at like 2 o'clock saying, hey, can we switch a song? If it's too much, just let me know because, you know, it's on hill, the piano stuff. But, uh, man, it's just beautiful. I was like, wow. It just spoke to me. You know how songs just kind of speak to you? It just spoke to me. And I thought, how neat is this? we got to play it. And then I thought, how come what's wrong with Christian radio? <laughs> Why aren't songs like this on the radio so people hear them? But Anyways, I just wanted to do this for you because it just really touched me. I'm the 
Lord praise. Stop me, church, for we wrap worship up. And uh, you know, a lot of us think a lot of times that we're not well, we're not good enough. You know, we're not worthy of anything that God has forgiven us from of our sins because we all feel. Who, I, I know I do. I feel like there's a lot of things I've done in my past that's unforgivable. Um, but you know, the Bible says that if you look towards Him and you ask for forgiveness, that He'll forgive you for your sins if you accept Him in your heart. He'll change you as far as the east is from the west. Amen. So, you know, every, there's different people at different parts in their walk, and some people who are being drawn to Christ, some people who haven't found him yet. But this, this, these words right here is what's so cool to me, because it doesn't matter who you are. You know I mean, you're, you're good enough. You know what I mean? And, and thank God that we are, right? Amen.
Praise the Lord. Can we uh, just affirm uh, these guys' giftedness and they're willing to share it with us today? Amen. Amen. Excellent job, guys, in leading us to God's throne today. Amen. Amen. Uh, I shared with you guys last week that uh, I didn't know if I was going to continue the sermon series or not. I prayed about it, and God said, one more. And uh, so uh, we're going to have one more sermon on Lead the Way. And today I want to talk to you about the art of turning problems into possibilities. Now, before I jump into that, uh, just looking at the title, just on its face, you might think, well, this is one of those pep talks that we're going to get. Uh, I wouldn't waste your time. I wouldn't waste my time with a pep talk. Uh, I'm only here to preach from the Word. Other than that, I don't have anything to say to you. Uh, so this is not a pep talk as much as it's a biblical talk. We're going to get into the book of Nehemiah, chapters 1 and 2, and we're going to see how God can take our problems, our challenges, those things that would depress and discourage us, and do something possibly with it. So if you want to go over to Nehemiah 1, we're going to kind of jump around and and see different things. I want to start with a couple of true stories real quickly, just snippets from life, uh, to lay the groundwork for what I'm talking about here today, because I don't want to lose you in the weeds of some sort of positive thinking, philosophical discussion. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everything was nice and so forth? So I want to talk about the, the, the theme for today, taking our problems and allowing God to do something with them. And so three quick stories, 1980, there's a lady by the name of uh, Carrie Leitner whose world is turned upside down when she gets a phone call from the police that her 13-year-old daughter has been killed by a drunk driver who has left her on the side of the road and left the scene. For months after her daughter's death, she, has, she is mourning, as you can imagine. She's in pain, she's in suffering, and then it turns into disgust when she learns that this guy has a track record of drunk driving. And basically at the time, the law would slap him on the hand and let him go and off he would go again. And so she decided to turn her pain and her anger and yes, her disgust in the legal system into something called MAD, M-A-D-D. -D. Anyone ever heard of Mothers Against Drunk Drivers? That started back in the 80s from, as a result of this. She decided to, to not just mourn her daughter's death, but to bring meaning to it and to help others so that other mothers would not have to go through what she went through. And so she founded this group and she discovered that there were a lot of people out there that were interested in joining and being a part of it. And so it is estimated that MAD, because they have been instrumental in changing state laws and even federal laws, that MAD has saved millions of lives since its founding. Going back again to the 80s, this time 1984, Augusto and Michaela Odon discovered that their son was diagnosed with ALD. I'm going to try my best to pronounce it. Cindy would do a much better job than me with her background in medicine. Adreno, Luico, Luco, there you go, I said that. Ditrostophy. Okay, she's... All right, so uh, let's just call it ALD. And there's no cure for it, and when it hits children, it's just devastating. It blinds children. Pardon me? Dystrophy. Dystrophy, gotcha. Dystrophy, oh, wow, okay. The YS messed me up, okay. ALD. Um, <laughs> so she... Um, uh, the, 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 the child goes blind, speechless, deaf, paralyzed, and then they die usually within a couple of years. And so this couple who had no medical background whatsoever, actually he was in banking, uh, put their life on hold and they devoted every moment they could to try to find a cure for their son. And eventually they did discover a cure that was not able to reverse the effects but slow them down for their son who lived to be 30 years old instead of dying when he was a teenager, when they anticipated. And it helped other 
parents out of this, this terrible disease, and uh, it's called Lorenzo's Oil. It was made into a motion picture back in the 80s. I don't know if you've seen it. It's an amazing movie. There's another uh, true life example, and uh, this one is in the, the spirit realm, uh, if you will. There was a uh, young lady in her 20s that uh, was in uh, Holland at the time the German army marched in in 1940, took the place over, and her and her family decided they were going to hide Jewish people because the Nazis were hunting them down, putting them in concentration camps. This is a good, godly Christian family. And so they began to hide Jews, and that went on for years until their hiding place was discovered. The family in, in total was shipped off to a concentration camp themselves where they all died except for this one young lady. And so at the end of the war, she came out of the concentration camp and had lost all her family. Every, her, 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 her place was devastated. And so she discovered, what am, she asked the question, God, what do you want me to do with my suffering? And God told her, travel the world and tell people about my love, my plan, and my forgiveness. And she traveled the world for the next 40 years, went to Billy Graham Crusades a lot, traveled the world, wrote books. Her name is Corey Tenboom. Anyone ever hear of Corey Tenboom? And uh, she, one of the principal things that she talked about was the ability to forgive people who do the worst things. She would share stories of forgiving SS officers in camps that she was in because of the love of Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about the, the ability that God can give us to take difficult, problematic issues, things that depress us, things that discourage us, and give us the possibility of turning them into something that will bless us and bless other people. So in this sermon series called uh, uh, I'll Go First, or, or I'll Lead the Way, rather, uh, we talked about the potential that if we're willing to lead the way in a new, faith-filled, bold way for God, that God can do something in our life. If we are willing to move from, we've talked about moving from the back of the line to the front of the line, from the sidelines to the front lines and so forth, and we have looked to the Word of God for uh, answers to these questions that we posed about leading and, and going first. Uh, we've looked at people like Moses. We've looked at people like Nehemiah, Joshua, Caleb, and uh, we've looked at them under the scope of difficult times, very difficult times, stepping out in faith, leading when nothing is ideal, when it seems like everything is falling apart. And I shared with you last week, Nehemiah is one of these guys that that is leading under fire. We call it leadership under fire. And here's a guy who hears from the Lord. He acts upon it. He rallies a group of people together who soon go in the tank and they're like, oh, we're depressed now. We're not going to do anything. He rallies them a second time and he runs into major opposition all along the way on this God mission that he feels God has given him. And every day, this guy faces brutal criticism. Every day, people are second-guessing him and, and doubting in his ability to do what God has told him to do. And he breaks through it all, and he accomplishes the plan that God has for his life. And if you recall from last week, we talked about the fact that anything we do for God will be opposed. It's just the way it is, right? Satan does not kick back and say, you know what, I think I'll just rest on this one. You know, while they hear from God and do something great for him, I'm going to take a break. The devil will always create obstacles and barriers. And yes, he's going to get some folks riled up. And he's going to send them after us as well. And the work that God has given us, we will accomplish it with his help, but we will always accomplish it going through difficult times. So Nehemiah, he wins my respect and my admiration because as I read his faith journey, as I read him stepping out in faith, and he's just going through terrible assaults, I mean, just terrible assaults, he comes through it. Yeah, he's beaten, he's bleeding, he, he, he's kind of un, uneven, you know, as he walks in a way, but he is victorious. And as we close today's sermon series, I think we have room to learn just a few more principles 
from this leader called Nehemiah on how to take a step of faith, how to go from the sidelines to the front lines or the sidelines or you, you know, whatever, to get on the field to play and, and, and do it even under the most severe circumstances. This is what we're going to learn today. Before we jump into it, I want to give you some quick reminders. Uh, revisit some principles. Just want to shoot them at you. Not explain them again, but just give them to you. Uh, some of the things we've learned so far in this series. If you do something new and bold for God, you won't be popular. We talked about that. Uh, you're going to be criticized. People come along, they're going to say, uh, that was stupid. Why in the world did you do that for? Uh, lead the way, here's another one, but always invite others to come along with you. You don't want to go on a journey alone. You want to bring folks along. Invite them to come. Uh, expect problems to arise. When you declare, I'm going to do something for God. I just feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to take a step of faith. And yeah, it's troublesome and difficult, but I'm going to do it anyways. You're going to face condemnation. There's going to be friction. There's going to be apathy on your team. Snafus will happen. Uh, opposition will arise. Here's another one. You have to be faith-filled when no one else is. That's a toughie, isn't it? Because a lot of times we Christians, we're always looking at somebody else, right? Even when we worship. You know, we feel like, hey, I want to raise my hand. We look around, nobody's raising their hand. Well, I'm not going to raise my hand then. Seems so like we're always feeding off each other. When our focus needs to be just on God, I don't care if anybody's raising their hand. I feel like I'm going to raise my hand. So it, 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 you, you have to be faithful when actually nobody else is. When everybody's like poo-poo, no, no, nothing's good, oh, the sky's falling. You've got to be that single voice that stands up and says, no, God, with God all things are possible. Another one is this. Our op optimism is rooted in God's ability, not our own. The only way that I can be optimistic and faith-filled is believing God, not in myself and not in other people, no matter how wonderful they may be. Um, I would not be here behind this, this lectern, this pulpit today, had I not settled the question a long time ago that God can do anything, that I, I can't get up here and preach and say, oh yeah, take a step of faith. Uh, but it ain't going to work out. I can't do that. <laughs> I've got to believe that with God, all things are possible. So if you're willing to lead the way, overcome criticism, if you're willing to ask God, increase your faith, invite others to come along with you, you can do something for God. You can step out of the sidelines. You can get off the bleachers. You can get down on the field. And God, I really believe, can give you a special anointing to do what he is asking and calling you to do on the Jesus journey. Now, last week I gave you a, a faith check, a reality check. I'm going to give you another reality check. We'll call it uh, 2.0. Here it is. Your journey begins where you are right now, not where you should be or hope to be. I'll say that one more time. Your journey begins where you are right now, not where you should be or you hope to be. So no matter where you are in your walk with God, your faith life, your, your level of, of, of trust and belief in God, or your optimism level, you always begin right where you are today, not where you want to be someday, not where you hope to be someday. So that means you step out right now where you're at. You could say, well, I'm at the back of the line. When you've been saying, step out of the back of the line, I mean, I'm the last person in the line. That's okay. Step out. Make progress. Move forward. Take a step of faith. If you're in the middle of the line, if you're somewhere near the front of the line, you're moving up towards the front, that's okay. Because wherever you're at, that's, when, that's where you need to start taking a step of faith. Because if you're waiting for the right moment to do something for God, to reverse an issue that's been troubling you in your life, it will never come if you're waiting for the right moment. That's what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. He says, I was a cupbearer to the king at the time. It's almost like he's announcing, this is where I started. What like, you know, that, that I waited for all the answers to prayer to come, and man, then I moved out. He said, that's where I started. I was a cupbearer for the king. He was a he was the guy that, that would taste the food and the, and the drink for the king before he would eat it. And he had to be a trusted servant. This wasn't some glorified butler here. This was a guy that, that uh, the, the emperor or the king had to absolutely trust. 
Because if he could slip some poison in, if he could be intimidated, if he could be bought off to slip just a little poison in the food or the drink, uh, then, then he would be gone. And so the king, the emperor, had to absolutely trust this guy. So they were really good friends in order to do that. So outside his own immediate family, the cupbearer was probably the closest guy to him. And, and so Nehemiah, he's, he, he is in kitchen staff here. He's a close friend of the Persian emperor. The Persian emperor at this time, the, the Persian empire is conquered. Just think of the Middle East. Everything from Turkey all the way to Iraq, uh, Iran, all the way south into Egypt, all of that is the Persian empire at this time. And, and so this is the guy that we're going to be learning about today, how to, how to step out, how to lead when you're under fire. Here's the first principle. I'm going to give you uh, four of them today. Number one, many God-inspired dreams begin with discouraging news and depressing feelings. The journey here begins with bad news, not good news, with bad news. Chapter one, Nehemiah's brother shows up from Jerusalem to visit, and he has come to the capital city. It's called Susa, which is in northwestern uh, Iran. And he comes to visit him, and, and they're catching up. They hadn't seen each other in, in years, actually. And he does like we would do. You know, if we had an out-of-town relative coming to stay with us from our old hometown, well, what would we ask him? How's dad and mom? How's Uncle George? You know, how, how's the local football team? You know, are, are they winning anything this year? You know, what's the news? And when he asks him this, Nehemiah's brother's demeanor kind of goes down. He gets very depressed. And he says, in essence, he says, well, brother, things aren't going well back home. The walls are a big pile of rubble. The gates are ashes. We have absolutely no protection Everybody laughs at us. Everybody laughs at our faith, our God. Everybody says, you know, I thought this was the God of the whole universe and look at his capital, look at his temple over there, look at his city. It's just a big pile of rubble. And so what happens is as soon as he hears those words, he gets this burden. Have you ever been there where you hear something and immediately it feels like somebody's dropped a weight on you? You're like, oh. And that's what the... That happens here. That's the impression we get in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Nehemiah says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You know, when we hear news that is so discouraging and it just breaks our heart so much that, that we're weeping, we can't sleep at night. And it's just like this heavy weight. We're just so discouraged. Those are the times we need to just kind of take a time out. That's where we need to stop doing what we normally do in the, the course of our week and say, you know what? I've got to process this with God. I've got to do something with this. You need to find out what God wants you to do with your feelings. Does God want you to sit there and mourn and feel bad and be discouraged? Or is there something more to it? And I'm not, I'm not talking about seeking God and having a, you know, a meeting of gripe session or the Life Stinks Club, but asking God, God, is there anything that I can do to help alleviate this burden I'm feeling on myself or others? And it may be the first step from you moving from the sidelines to the front lines. When you hear something so, so, so bad, so difficult, so challenging, that you just get this weight dropped on your, your chest, that, that may be the, the first movement, the first step that God's going to take you from the sidelines to the front lines, from apathy to engagement, from running away from the problem to running towards the problem. And usually when we receive discouraging news like that, we all have a tendency to do one of three things. The first one is this. We leap before we look. Or secondly, we look and never leap. Or thirdly, we try to forget we've ever heard about it. So when we see something wrong in the world, we hear something wrong in the world, we have this tendency to just kind of jump right in without talking to God, without talking to any spiritually minded folks, our brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe some spiritual leaders, and saying, man, I've got this really big burden and I don't know what to do with it. What do you think? And many times this results in us 
making decisions based on anger and fear and discouragement that leads us down pathways that God never intended for us to go down those paths. We say things, we do things, we act on things we never should have said, we never should have done, and we should, never should have acted upon. So we leaped before we looked. We acted before we sought God. We said, you know what, I'm just going to get in there and deal with that thing. Or we feel like we can't do anything. We're just so discouraged, things look so uh, impossible, this feeling of powerlessness comes over us where our faith just kind of shrinks up. And, and so we, we never leap into the problem at all. We just kind of look at it for a little while and then we run away from it. Or the third one, we just ignore it. I think this is where most people are today. Because of the nature of life right now for us, we have so much bad news going on. We get overload, don't we? Anybody there with me? Amen. You just hear so much bad stuff. You know, the economy, the virus, you know, the Chinese, the Russians, the Taliban, what's going up on in Washington, lawlessness, the border. And at some point, it's almost like we have this shutoff valve where we say, I just can't care anymore. I just can't deal with the immensity of the problems that I, I'm looking at and getting so discouraged over. So instead of taking God-given burdens and seeing what he wants us to do with them, we just kind of slide into apathy and willful ignorance. Now, if we had just slowed down long enough like Nehemiah did, after we received the burden to talk to God, to process things with God, and to hear back from God, how much better would things be for us? That's what Nehemiah did. Look at the last part of verse 4. He fasted and prayed before the Lord, before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah, he just presses a pause button in his life, and he probably wanted to be on the first bus to Jerusalem to start fixing things, but instead he slowed down, he prayed, he fasted, he talked to God, he waited on the Lord, and he was waiting for God's perfect timing. And after a time of prayer and fasting, he makes his request to God, open the, the king, open the king. What does it say here? Let me go back. Uh, Open the heart, rather, of the king to my request to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. You know that process took four months from the time that he began to pray to the time he asked the king? So he slows down. He says, okay, I'm not going to just every, I'm not going to watch my favorite TV programs and just go about life as usual. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to engage in this moment with me and give me some direction. Most of us don't do that. Most of us don't use prayer as the first step. Usually it's the last step. You know, we'll do everything. You know, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do that, and everything. Well, I've exhausted all the means, now I'll go pray. Or here's another thing that, that we do a lot. We seek out God's input after we've already decided. And we'll say, well, I better pray now because I've got a plan and I want God to bless this plan that I've created. We've got to learn to do what Nehemiah did. When God gives us a burden, pause, pray, fast, seek God, and wait on him. And this is what Nehemiah discovers during that four-month prayer. His burden for the walls of Jerusalem are synced perfectly with God's heart and God's will. God shares the same burden. God says, I want those walls rebuilt as well. It took four months talking to God for Nehemiah to link up with, with God and see that the burden he had is the same as God's burden. And then God stepped in and he gave Nehemiah an open door of opportunity. And once the emperor begins to see how downcast his buddy is, Nehemiah, he's been that way for days now, and, and the king of Persia looks at him and he says, hey, bro, what's up? I mean... You've been looking really depressed lately. Can you tell me what's going on? And Nehemiah answers him in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3. I said, long live the king. And why shouldn't I be depressed when the city, the city where all my family is buried, is in ruins, and the city gates have been reduced to cinders? 
Nehemiah sees that, that God has given him an opportunity now to raise the issue with the king. All of this comes as a result of prayer, and he realizes that he goes, I have this special relationship with the king. Now I can leverage the influence of this relationship to, to see things happen, which brings us to our second principle, one I've shared in, the pre, in the previous sermons. Number two, own your burden. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we go on Twitter and create hashtags, rebuild the walls. It doesn't mean that we get on Facebook and we work uh, uh, another thousand people up where they just write all these you know, likes and dislikes and all of that. It doesn't mean we get so upset that we tell everybody we can how angry we are so that they can get as angry as we are. This is what Nehemiah did with his burden. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 5. Send me back to Judah so that I can rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Do you see what Nehemiah does there? He didn't say, you know, emperor, I think somebody should do this. I think this is a good thing. And I know you know a lot of people who can do this. He threw his own hat into the ring. He said, let me help. More to the point for our sermon series, let me help lead the way. I'll be the first. And the king says this. He says, you've been a faithful servant. You've been a good friend of mine for a long time. He goes, what do you need? And Nehemiah takes the opportunity that he has been dwelling on for four months in prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord. And it all comes together in that one moment, that one question the emperor poses, what do you need from me? And Nehemiah jumps all over that thing. He says, send me. I want to help. And Nehemiah says to the king, just send me back home. I'll take care of things. He didn't say send someone else back. He said, send me. And so he took ownership over his own burden. He didn't try to pass it on to someone else. A lot of times we'll do that. Oh, I feel so bad about this. And then what do we follow up with? Somebody, right? Somebody needs to do something about it. You know what I've discovered who somebody is a lot of times? It's us. God's waiting for us to move. You know what's amazing? The king agrees. He, he lets him go to Jerusalem. Now, how does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens, because the groundwork was laid in four months of prayer. And while Nehemiah is praying, it may not seem like anything's happening to him, but God's taking every day of that four months to tenderize the heart of the king and put this in his mind so that when Nehemiah comes, the king's like, yeah, that's cool, you can go. And what's crazy is the king gives him everything he needs to get the job done. He, he gives him building material from his forest. He gives him soldiers to protect him on his journey there. He gets a title so he's respected. The king gives him absolutely everything he needs in order to get the job done. And I just want to follow that up by saying this. That is the power of prayer. Amen? That, that's taking your burden, syncing it up with God's burden, praying, fasting, confirming and then watching God move. Isn't that what prayer, part of, a big part of prayer is? Is just seeking the heart of God and watching him move? And then thirdly, understand why you're doing what you're doing. Somebody asks you, what are you doing that for? What are you going to tell them? Well, nobody else is doing it. Somebody got to do it, you know. Man, that, that's, that's really faith-filled right there, you know. So Nehemiah goes home. And he starts doing this hard work. He takes a late night tour of the city. He doesn't tell anyone he's going to do it. That's why he does it in the middle of the night. Takes his donkey and he rides around. And he's just kind of inspecting things. He's evaluating things. He's examining things. Maybe he's prioritizing things. Uh, very similar to what I did when I first came here. First, first three months, the only thing I did was sit back and watch and build, try to build relationships and evaluate what's going on, what's gone bef on before, what's going on now, what is God leading us in? And so that's what Nehemiah does. And after inspecting the city, he creates this plan. And the next day he wakes up and he goes out and he talks to the people. Nehemiah 2.17 is the scripture. But when I got back, this is him talking, I said to them, Jerusalem is truly in a mess. The gates have been torn down and burned, and everything is in ruins. 
We must rebuild the city wall so that we can again take pride in our city. Now, if Nehemiah had been a politician, he might have come up with a slogan. Maybe created hats. Make Jerusalem great again. You know, I don't know. And, 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 but that's not Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not a politician. He, he didn't stand behind the, the, the podium that day and gather the crowds and give this political speech and say, you know what, we just need to have a good city here. He rallies the people together and he gives this inspirational spiritual speech that's on par with Mel Gibson's speech in, in Braveheart and because it works the people up. The people don't just say, well, We've heard that one before. We're going back to work. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's what we've been waiting for. And he looks at the people and he calls them out. And he, he says, listen, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. He said, all you got to do is look around, look at your walls, look at your gates, look out your front window that you look out every day and see the condition of our city. We've got some big problems here, but here's the thing. If you will trust in God and if you will help out, it will get done. And then he asks them, I'm just curious, how many people live by the broken gates? And a segment raised their hand. Yeah, I, I live right down the street. And Nehemiah says, hey guys, guess what? I brought a lot of lumber with me. He says, you help me out and we'll rebuild those gates again. And he gathers all the people of the city together and he helps them to understand that if the job is going to get done, everyone, 100%, everyone is going to have to do a portion of the work and it will get done if everyone will do a portion of the work. The walls can be rebuilt. The gates can be rebuilt if everybody pitches in to some degree. And so Nehemiah challenges everybody, not just the professional carpenters and the brick masons and the blacksmiths, but the regular folks, the people who can do on-the-job training, the folks who can be gophers and run and get stuff. He challenges everybody, you can be a part of this. And then in Nehemiah 2.18, we get the response of the people. I absolutely love it. They said this, we're with you, let's get started. They rolled up their sleeves ready for the good work. That's a message translation. And do you know what the most awesome part of that response is? Notice what the people called it. Do the people call it the rebuilding of the walls project? Do the people call it the, the renovation of the gates project? What do they call it? They called it the good work. Isn't that so cool? They called it the good work. What did they call it the good work for? Because they recognized it was of God. You see, Nehemiah didn't show up and say, hey, I got a really good idea. I think we could, we could do something good here. He says, God told me. I had a burden. I took it to God. God said, hey, I got the same burden. I'm going to send you to get the job done. And so when they heard that, they said, oh, it's from God. So what is it? It is good work if it's from God. Boy, I wish we talked more like that today. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, Pastor Mike, I'll, instead of saying, you know what, I'll help out with that church project or I'll help out with that church improvement project or I'll help out with the ministry that we're going to start with the school down the street. I, I would love it if we could start training ourselves to start saying the, of the things of God. Yeah, I'll help out with that good work. I'll help out with God's work. I'll help out with the good work. And what happened after that from the get-go? They're threatened by the enemy, enemies in the area. They go through some, some major league, mean-spirited criticism that would have rocked most of us. Most of us would have thrown our hands up and say, it's, it's bad enough, I've got to work out here after I get done with work, and I've got people yelling at me for it. I'm qu I quit, I'm done with it. Nehemiah had to have some brutally honest conversations with the enemies trying to shut the whole thing down, and he had to create a defensive strategy to combat that. And so it wasn't all peaches and cream. When he gave this wonderful speech, they had to fight every day to see that wall go up just another 12 inches every day, but that was okay. Why was it okay? Because it was the good work. 
and it was God's work. If it's God's work, it's good work. Amen? Amen. Here's a neat thing. Everything that could go wrong with that project did not go wrong. All the fears they had didn't happen. All the worries they had that the enemy was going to come in and just beat the tar out of them never happened. Nehemiah made sure he was in sync with God. He owned his burden. He understood why he was doing what he was doing. It was God's work. It was good work. And all their fears never happened. That happens a lot with us, right? We entertain our worst fears. The devil makes sure, oh, this is going to happen. Oh, that bad. Oh, man. Oh, I can see it coming right now. But if we just trust in God and in the good work we're doing for him, a lot of those things never happen. Andy Stanley pastors one of the largest churches in America, north of Atlanta. And uh, when COVID hit his church, he pastors a church of 40,000 people, um, he decided something it was controversial at that time. He was going to close his church the rest of the year. And I'm not here to debate that with you, pros or cons. Uh, I, I really don't want to debate that with you. But uh, he, as a result of that, a lot of people got angry. And they said, well, if I can't physically come to church, I ain't coming here and I'm not going to support it anymore. And so he took a huge hit numerically and financially uh, through his church. And he's gone through tough times. And so in the middle of those, those really challenging times for him, someone asked him, said, how do you keep your spirit up with tough times like this that you're going through? How do you keep moving forward in the church ministry? And this is what he said. This is classic Andy Stanley, if you've ever heard of him. They were asking, how do you stay positive? How do you stay effective in difficult times? He said, if all else fails, I channel my inner middle school girl in pursuit of an iPhone. <laughs> Here's the deal. This middle school girl in pursuit of an iPhone... Does she ever take no for an answer? you got a teenage girl at home, or you know, right? Uh, she will be dedicated to the mission. She will be resourceful. She will go to mom, and when mom says no, who is she going to? She's going to go to dad. And then when dad says no, she's going to grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and cousins twice removed and neighbors and everybody she can. She will not quit until she gets that iPhone. And no matter how many roadblocks she hits, no matter how many times she is discouraged that you will never get that iPhone, she keeps going until she gets the iPhone. And that's what Andy Stanley said. He said, I do God's work, and so I keep going. That's the exact same thing Nehemiah did. This was his secret in completing his God-given burden project. He didn't quit until the job was done. And he put up with so much junk every day, criticism, tired workers belly aching, personal attacks on him, threats, losing half of his workforce to security. He organized a plan to stop the enemy. The guy is constantly moving from one thing to the other, but in the end, the wall is completed because he never quit. It slowed down at times, but he never quit and the job was done. Here's the fourth and final point. Do it in love or don't do it at all. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. We're going to deviate from Nehemiah and I want to go to the New Testament to talk a little bit about love. Now, you would think we wouldn't have to talk about love in the church because we assume that everybody who goes to church has Jesus in their heart. And if Jesus is in our heart, we love everybody, right? That's what we assume. Uh, you know, the Spirit of God dwells in us. And if the Spirit of God dwells in us, there's going to be some awesome love there. But sometimes it's not there. Sometimes we really miss this important truth, especially when it comes to leadership. And let me ask you a question. What are the two biggest problems in our nation today? I, I talked a little bit about this uh, early on in this sermon series. When you take all the lawlessness that we have in the land right now, all the chaos, the messed up economy, empty store shelves, the mess in foreign policy, the mess in how COVID is being handled, the border crisis, the division in this country, the anger, 
the hatred, the visceral hatred coming just from the depths of, uh, of people's heart for one another because of differences of opinion. What are the two things that people yearn for more than anything else? They'll, they'll share it in different ways, but it boils down to two things. I'm going to give them to you. First is this, leadership. A majority of the problems I would, I would maintain today comes from a lack of leadership. And if we just had responsible, good, sound, common sense leadership, we would be in a lot better place than we are in this nation. And people want that. They may not get it, but they want it. The second thing is love. They may not articulate it that way, but it boils down to that. A majority of our problems that we have beyond leadership is because of a lack of love. And I believe lost people particularly yearn for a Jesus-style love in their life to be shown and reflected towards them. Do you know what I've witnessed uh, in the church, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, even before COVID? I think COVID just really uh, highlighted and put a lot of lights on it. But what I've witnessed in the, the last 10 to 12 years, I've watched what I have been preaching happen. I've watched people move from the sidelines to the front lines. I've watched people move from ap apathy to engagement. I've watched people who the Holy Spirit has said, step out, take a step of faith. Don't run for the exit sign, run towards the front, be engaged. And I've watched that and I have celebrated that and I've rejoiced in that, but I've also watched other people come alongside of them and begin to poo-poo what they're trying to do. And when we, we hear the, the burden that they have for a, a better world, a better church, a better community, and those folks are trying their very best to do that, Some, they, they have this tough, faith-filled, bold view for God. They're like, I'm going to do something for God. I've got the burden. I'm going to move forward. So many times we go up to them, most of the time behind their back, and boy, do we send them down the road. We point out all the wrong things that they're doing, even though we're not doing anything to help them at all. We have no problem pointing out the problems in other people, how they're messing up. We just have a hard time pointing out the fact that we don't really do a whole lot to help them out. And so they're out there, they're playing on the field, they're doing the best they can, they're doing things, they're showing up, they're coming to practice, they're working hard, they're working the plays, they're listening to everything the coach is saying, they're faithful, and there we are up in the bleachers complaining with one eye on the scoreboard and the other eye on the exit sign. And that, my friends, is just so wrong. If that is our idea of doing something new for God, of leading where others are not, of loving people, then we've missed the boat. And here's why. Do people see God's love in us when all we do is viciously criticize others for trying stuff that we never even try? We don't see God's God in them, do we? Do we ever see the spirit of God in people when they step out and say, I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm, it's gonna work. I probably will fail, but I don't know. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try something new and faith-filled and bold for God. And we come up alongside and say, forget about it. You ain't gonna do anything. When we tear other people down, whether it's on social media or, or whatever because they're not doing a fantastic job or they're trying to do something new and we think it's going to fail, do other people comment on the comment section of Facebook, Facebook, Facebook and say, dude, that's awesome how you tore that person apart. I mean, I saw God all over you. They don't do that. No, people don't see God in us when we do that. This is what they see in us, unfortunately. They see hate. They see anger. They see hypocrisy, they see jealousy, and they see a critic. And those are things that do not prove to them that the love of God is in our heart. What it proves to them is there's a critical spirit, there's an unhelpful spirit in our heart. You know, COVID has been a nightmare on so many different levels, but it has also been revealing on the Church of Jesus Christ, particularly in, in, in North America, because it has exposed a lot of sins in the church. 
is exposed to a lot of carnality and unfaithfulness and flightiness and a lot of anger and a lot of unforgiveness and a lot of bad attitudes have been exposed. And this is what I want to say. If we are going to do something new and fresh and bold for God, it cannot be business as usual for the church anymore. Amen? We can't show up to a God movement. We can't show up when the first person steps out of the sidelines and says, hey, I want to help. I want to do something great for God. And our first response is, I want to be critical of you. I want to tear you down. I want to try to stop you from, from, ha from that happening. We need to stop that right now. Amen. In the name of Jesus, stop that stuff. People need to see the love of Jesus in us or, or, or we're toast, my friends. Let's let people see Jesus' love coming out of us. Amen? Let people see someone who moves from the sidelines to the playing field, and we are there waiting for them and saying, man, it is so good to have you a part of the team. Amen. Christians, we've got to start acting like Jesus in our love for other people or burn toast. we got nothing to say. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13.3. If I gave everything I had to, the, to poor people and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel but didn't love others, it would be of no value whatsoever. Paul said, I could feed every hungry person on the planet. I could put every person through college. I could cure COVID. I could build the biggest church in the history of the world. But if I don't love people, he said, I've wasted my time. So never forget number four, when God gives you a burden to do something new and faith-filled and bold for God and move from the sidelines to the front lines, make sure that you are filled with the love of God through Christ Jesus, amen? Do you know what I appreciate so much about Nehemiah? You get what you see. There's nothing phony about him. Nehemiah, he didn't have to be there. He had a cozy job back where he was at. I mean, he was, he was tasting the food for the king of Persia. I mean, that's a pretty good job, right? I mean, he's get, getting some good food from the guy. But as soon as he gets that burden, man, that just makes me feel so bad. It just depresses me, discourages me. He says, I'm going to take that to God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to seek God. And during that four-month interval, he says, okay, God, what would you like me to do? God says, I've already been working on the king of Persia. Go and talk to him. He was there for one reason, actually two reasons. Nehemiah was there. He didn't have to be. He was there because he loved God and he loved God's people and he wanted to help. He wanted to help them regain their standing in the community again. He wanted to give them a godly purpose in their life again. He wanted to help them walk in the will of God. He wanted them to be a good, godly, spiritual people again. He was there because his heart was filled with the love of God and his heart was filled with love for them, even though sometimes he wondered when they were criticizing him. So as I close this series and today's sermon, Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem rebuilt two and a half miles of wall in 52 days. The wall at that time was eight feet thick, 40 feet high. It took approximately seven weeks and two days thousands of years ago. It all began with bad news, discouraging news, owning that burden, not pushing it off on somebody else, sinking his burden with God, knowing why he was doing what he was doing. He was motivated by the love of God and love for other people. The outcome was a miracle. Walls like that don't go up in 52 days without heavy equipment. They did it in their time in the Bronze Age, just using donkeys and camels and their own uh, 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 hands to do it. God honors his leadership. So here's my challenge to you. We're gonna wrap the sermon up, the series up with this. I wanna challenge you. What is discouraging you the most in your life right now? Think about it. You don't have to think long because you already know, right? <laughs> What is the burden you've been carrying? And you can itemize it, burden one, two, three. What's the top burden? And ask God, just, and you're praying, as you're praying, God, what do you want me to do 
with that burden? Do you want to move it from the burden category into the possibility category? Do you want to change things? Do you want to use me? Do you want to use my prayers, my faith, my participation? And as you take your burden to God, Jesus is going to invite you to step out from wherever you're at into new faith-filled, bold things for him. Your leadership will your leadership and your participation will flow from your burden. Your burden will become God's marching orders. And as you lead the way, you are invited to invite others along to say, you know what? We're starting this new thing. I've had this burden for a long time and I was wondering if you want to come along. Isn't that what the folks did when I, at the very beginning of this sermon? The lady that began Mothers Against Drunk Drivers? She invited others to come along. You know, anybody else care about drunk drivers? Anybody else lose a loved one to a drunk driver? You have? Oh, would you like to join us? You're welcome to come. So I want to ask you one final time, what is your burden? What is depressing you the most? What is discouraging you the most right now that has broken your heart, that has brought tears to your eyes, that's keeping you awake at night? This is what I want you to do. Write it down. Take it home. Pray over it until God answers your prayer and gives you a plan. Then, I, this is what I want you to do. Compare your notes with others. What you may find is there are some folks who have the same burden you have. And you're going to be able to say, hey, you want to do this together? And invite them along on a new faith-filled journey with God. Then I want you to come and share that with us if it's appropriate for you. Because we would like to pray with you. And if you're open to to spiritual counsel, we'd love to, to do that. And if we can help in any way as a church, we'd love to do that too. Can I pray for you today? Would that be all right? If you would like to take your burden today and ask God to replace it with possibility to make this place and his kingdom a better place, just seek his face in prayer. So let's pray. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? And if anyone already has that burden and you'd like to come, you want to kneel at the altar, feel free to do that. You step out. If you're at home, you may want to just take a, a knee there by your couch or your desk, wherever you may be as well. Let's just pray. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we come before you today. Lord, there's so much discouragement in this world today that would weigh us down and make us feel powerless to do anything about it where all we want to do is run away or, and hide, or even worse, just kick back and complain and criticize others who are trying to do their best. Jesus, help us not to do any of those things, but instead take the burdens we have to you, to sink our spiritual heartbeat with you, to be led by your spirit, to take that burden and take, turn it into an action plan to make things better because of our love for you and our love for people. Help us to no longer run and hide from our burdens or complain and criticize others who are trying to build your kingdom. Help us to get off the sidelines, to, to get to the front lines. Help us to get from, from, from the, the bleachers out into the playing field because we know that's where broken things are fixed. That's where victories are won, all in the name of Jesus. And we pray this in Christ's name and all of God's people agreed by saying, amen. Let's give God praise today, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, God bless you guys. And as I said, and let, I haven't even checked the weather out, but if the weather's okay Wednesday night, 6 p.m. right here at the church, we're going we're gonna to have a, about a, a four-week time of meeting uh, to talk about leadership principles and stepping out in faith, and you're more than welcome to come. God bless you guys. Have a great day.